Okay, today we're going to be talking about the European explorations uh, in the late 1400s, early 1500s, and the European conquest of the Caribbean islands, which is the first places that they tended to land. And uh, from there we're going to talk about their impact on the Caribbean, the natural environment, and the native population. And that will set up the uh, type of uh, colonial normalcy that the, especially the Spanish government will run in their colonies that will uh, they'll extend into their larger conquest that we'll talk about in future lectures. So the first step is really to talk about why the Europeans wanted to go off and launch off onto these uh, colonization attempts, these conquests. Uh, it, a lot of it really stems, goes all the way back to the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople in the mid-1400s, in the 1450s. Uh, the Muslim armies have been trying to take Constantinople for hundreds of years, as we talked about last time, and uh, the new Muslim empire, called the Ottoman Empire, which rose in the 1200s, uh, is extremely powerful and eventually is capable and does conquer uh, Constantinople in 1453, which is a long and complex story all by itself, but uh, we'll shorten that just by saying they conquered the city in 1453, uh, renamed the city Istanbul, and made it into the new Ottoman capital city, since it was so hard to conquer in the first place, they fig figured it was a great fortress to base their government in. So this creates a big kind of economic shock to a lot of Europeans because uh, Constantinople was hugely important to the trade networks between Europe and uh, what we today call the Middle East, uh, going through ancient Persia, which is basically today Iran, um, and going across northern India and all the way to the Far East uh, to China. So that trade was extremely valuable to European companies and uh, they, those companies and traders and merchants, they wanted to continue to have access to those trade networks, to continue moving people and goods back and forth from Europe uh, all the way as far east as China. Um, so Constantinople is kind of the doorway or the gateway that gets uh, people and goods over land from Europe uh, into um, kind of the Anatolian Peninsula and uh, the Eastern Mediterranean as it connects out toward uh, Old Mesopotamia and Persia. And the Ottomans knew that uh, these trade networks were so important. That's one reason they wanted to conquer the city. Also, uh, the Ottomans wanted to uh, tax the European and the other uh, travelers and merchants from other civilizations as they pass through Constantinople uh, because they know these merchants are moving through the area with either a lot of money to go to another civilization and buy goods or they're returning to their own civilization with those goods so either way they have a lot of uh, valuables with them uh, and the Ottomans decide to tax them as heavily as they possibly can um, so yeah a lot of these merchants they figure they don't really have much of another option there's no other route to go through so they have to pay the tax and uh, the European merchants especially feel economically squeezed and they're very angry that um, not only are their tax rates going up for this travel but now they're paying taxes to uh, the Muslim Kingdom the Muslim Empire which most Europeans are pretty aware that the Muslim government um, the Ottomans they take that tax revenue and they spend that money on more soldiers and bigger armies to launch even more attacks into Europe so the Europeans feel that uh, they're being attacked with their own money and in, in a certain way uh, so the Europeans are very angry and upset uh, that Constantinople has fallen and they're paying these taxes and these taxes are used for uh, attack against them uh, further conquest going further into Europe so uh, the Europeans start looking for other alternative ways to get to those markets in India, East Asia, Persia. Um, and the big idea that some Europeans hit on is to try e exploring through the oceans, to try to find some kind of sea-based route for traders to get to India and East Asia 
uh, without having to go the land-based way through Constantinople. So several European explorers kind of get involved in this. Um, the kind of best funded private explorers are mostly from northern Italy uh, because that's where a lot of trade is happening. That's where the kind of economic boom that's happening in Europe is going on is in northern Italy at the time in the 1400s. So a lot of Italian explorers uh, get involved in thinking about how to find a sea-based route to get to the the Indian markets especially. But those private northern Italian explorers don't have a whole lot of funding. I mean some of them are rich and some of them have a couple boats or something like that. Uh, but pretty quickly it becomes obvious that any kind of major exploration, any great voyages are going to take more resources than really any private explorer in, in northern Italy, Italy or really anywhere else has access to. So um, it really is going to come down to government funding. Uh, some government that has a large enough tax base to build up the money and the resources to to launch one of these voyages or several of these voyages is probably what it's going to take. And uh, Portugal had already been exploring the western African coastline since the early 1400s so Portugal already has a few decades of experience with this and so um, the Portuguese uh, government figures that this is a good opportunity to fund some explorations to go even further south along the African uh, coastline, the western coastline along the Atlantic and try to find some kind of way of getting around Africa and going uh, by ocean all the way to India. So as we talked about last time, uh, Prince Enrique um, was one of the big kind of government players involved in the, in the Portuguese attempts at voyages uh, through the 1450s when he eventually died. And uh, the Portuguese king, uh, Joao, uh, becomes very interested in giving government funding to these voyages to keep going further and further south uh, because he and his advisors realized that any government that finds the secret of getting to India faster and cheaper um, will have basically a, a great kind of national security secret. They can send their own merchants out to India and buy up cheap Indian goods and bring them back to Europe and sell them for a huge profit and the government can tax them. Uh, as they go through the whatever Portuguese owned sea routes or controlled sea routes that, uh, that Portugal can set up and defend. So any government that is able to do this through taxation stands to make a huge amount of money and could launch to the heights of world power just based on you know, finding the secret and uh, sending its traders out to um, take advantage of that secret. So the Portuguese king in the 1480s decides to uh, start funding expeditions. And so a lot of explorers start going to the Portuguese king and uh, his court, his royal advisors, and they start making basically sales pitches about uh, what their plan is, um, what they think is the best route, and uh, how, many, how much resources, how much money they're going to need to uh, go off and do that voyage and, and see if they're correct. So a lot of these explorers um, go to the government and basically ask for funding and give a sales pitch uh, of their plan and, and see if the government agrees that it's a good investment. One of the early attempts at a sales pitch is uh, this guy named Cristobal Colon, who later his name gets kind of bastardized, anglicized, uh, down to an English version of Christopher Columbus. Uh, he goes to the Portuguese government and gives his own sales pitch for what he calls a westward expedition. And this is the idea, uh, to go back to the map real quick, um, of sailing from Portugal, from Iberia, directly westward to get to India as fast as possible. And Cristobal Colon tells the Portuguese leaders that he thinks he can do this quicker than anyone else because according to his mathematical findings, his own personal research, he believes that China is only 5,000 miles west from Portugal. And that was a shocking uh, thing to say to the government because most scientists and map makers uh, and people who are kind of expert in this type of stuff uh, believe that 
uh, China was actually about 13,000 miles away, uh, directly west from Portugal. So uh, Cologne goes to the Portuguese government and says, actually, I think that most of the scientists are wrong, and they're wrong by about seven or 8,000 miles. So if you give me some money and some boats and uh, you know, resources, food and supplies and a crew, uh, I'll take a couple boats directly westward um, I only need enough funding for 5,000 miles because that's where China is and I'll sail directly west and get to China faster than anyone else in the world. And so that's uh, his sales pitch to the Portuguese government and so you know once the meeting is over uh, Cologne leaves and uh, the king and his advisors their own private meeting and the advisors tell the king this guy is dead wrong. Uh, every scientist that is knowledgeable about this in the world agrees that uh, the Earth is much larger than Cologne thinks it is. Um, it's uh, several thousand miles larger than he thinks it is, so his projections are off. So if you give him enough funding to go 5,000 miles, he's probably going to get out there in the ocean, and they're going to run out of food, and they're going to die somewhere out there. So any money that you give this guy is basically going to be a waste. He might as well just burn it because it's not going to have any result. He's not going to find China. He's not going to make it to China. Uh, he might get shipwrecked or something out there, but uh, you give him ships and a crew, and they set sail, that's the last you're ever going to hear from them, because they're going to die out there somewhere. And, um, you know, the king generally agrees with his advisors. Uh, the king is not a great scientist himself, so he, like most leaders, listen to their advisors and this type of stuff. And uh, they turn down Cologne's request for funding because they don't think it's a good bet, a good investment for the government. Um, there's many other explorers who make their own sales pitches to the Portuguese government. Uh, the one that they eventually choose to fund is from Bartolomeu Diaz, who proposed uh, taking a southern voyage, a uh, large amount of money, ships and crew and resources and all that, and he wants to sail directly south and go along the coastline of Africa. And his hope is to find the end of Africa um, going south, uh, wherever that land ends. And he wants to find the kind of the tip of Africa on the southern side and find where that is and sail around it and get to India. So that's his plan. Um, he has much more reliable statistics on how big he thinks Africa might be. Uh, nobody really knows how large Africa is in all of Europe. So um, Diaz seems like a safer um, investment, though, because he says, I'm not just going to sail out into the open ocean. I'm going to at least stick to the coastline. Uh, so if I get into trouble, I might be able to pull into a, a harbor somewhere and uh, figure out what's going on. Um, and if we do get into big trouble, we can just turn around and go back up the coastline and get back home. So uh, at the very least, you're going to um, kind of map some new areas of Africa, even if we don't get to the southern edge of Africa, well, at least learn something valuable. So the government thinks that he is a much better investment. And so they decide to fund his voyage instead. And he sets sail in 1487 from Lisbon, uh, the Portuguese capital city and uh, sails down for about a year following the African coastline pretty closely as you can see by this map and they eventually get to the southern tip of Africa uh, they get around it um, but at that point a bunch of his sailors appear to have gotten very nervous um, they have gone much much further than any other European exploration on record so they're starting to worry about how far they've gone and that they might be running out of supplies soon and so uh, they basically threaten to mutiny um, and they tell Diaz you're either going to turn this boat around or we're going to go back home or else uh, we'll kill you and we'll turn the boat back around ourselves and go back home. So it's a pretty clear choice for Diaz. Uh, they turn around some point in 1488 and start the northern trip back to uh, Portugal and arrive back in Lisbon in about 1489. And uh, Diaz returns uh, declares his voyage to be extremely successful because they found the southern tip and the open ocean going eastward. And uh, from that point forward, Portugal is extremely interested and will fund an increasing amount of expeditions to go around the tip and eventually get to India. So uh, Diaz becomes kind of uh, 
famous throughout Europe for finding the secret. Um, and of course, the Portuguese government can't hold the secret uh, to themselves. The Portuguese government is mostly going to try to uh, militarily defend the sea routes as best they can to control it. Uh, but word gets out and other explorers, n other nations are going to get interested in uh, kind of replicating the explorations or finding an even faster route around Africa. Um, but Diaz is the one who found the major route around what we today call South Africa. Uh, so what happened to Cologne and all this, uh, or after all of this? Uh, Cologne took his own sales pitch uh, that the Portuguese rejected and went to the country next door, uh, went to Castile or the kingdom next door is a better way to put it and uh, Cologne gave his sales pitch uh, to uh, Isabel of Castile in 1492 and her scientific advisors um, and it's the same sales pitch uh, the whole world believes that uh, uh, China is somewhere like 13,000 miles away directly west from Iberia um, but I think I have found uh, mathematical flaws in their theory, and I think it's really 5,000 miles. So give me the funding, I'll sail the 5,000 miles and get to China much, much faster than the Portuguese are doing going around South Africa. And it's largely the same kind of result. He gives a sales pitch and you know, leaves the room, and the next day the Castile high-level government has a meeting uh, to discuss uh, what Cologne had proposed. And uh, it's largely the same thing. The scientific advisors say, no way, uh, this guy's numbers are way, way off. If you give him funding for 5,000 miles, again, he's going to go out there, he's going to die, you're never going to hear from him again, so the money will just be wasted. So meeting ends, and the government basically decides, no deal, they're not going to fund Cologne's voyage. But after that meeting, one minister in the Spanish government um, had a private meeting with the Queen and a couple of advisors. And this minister said, look, yeah, the scientists are probably right. You give Cologne the ships and the crew and the resources to go 5,000 miles, he's probably going to go out there and die. But what if he's right? And what if we're wrong? What if China is only 5,000 miles away? If it's true, and uh, Castile can dominate the trade routes directly west that would be much, much faster, much more efficient than any other trade routes that we know of to get to China and India, then Castile will dominate the, the Indies trade markets. And we can tax all the merchants going back and forth. And um, Castile can make a massive unimaginable amount of money off of that that can make Castile into the most powerful kingdom in Europe and possibly in the whole world. So this minister says just think about that possibility and we'll calculate how much money it's going to cost to uh, give Cologne the, the resources to go up the 5,000 miles just to see and once that calculation is done um, you know the, the minister says look it Comparatively, it's not really that much money to invest in his voyage. And he also says, look, we just completed the reconquest. It's over. It's ended in 1492. But we're still taxing Castile, the Castilian economy, to keep running those wars. So the wars are over, but we're still seeing the money come in through taxation. So this advisor says, we have a bunch of extra money laying around that we're not really using that much of right now. So let's take some of it, fund Cologne's voyage, and if he goes out there and dies, oh well, that's his fault, and a little bit of our money is gone, but uh, we have a, a kind of budget surplus right now. So this minister tells the high-level government, it's worth the risk. Because the reward, if Cologne is correct, is so unbelievably massive that we might as well take the risk. Even if we lose the money, not a big deal. And so that convinces the Castilian government and the Queen to, um, to fund Cologne's voyage. So over the summer of 1492, 
uh, they um, assign three boats to Cologne and Cologne uh, gets the funding and he starts loading up those boats hiring sailors uh, getting the resources and food and everything he's going to need for these voyages together um, and he prepares to leave in summer of 1492 and um, the Spanish government in this deal to fund him uh, reportedly also promised that uh, any land that Cologne discovered any islands or anything that uh, would be useful to control for Castile as a uh, kind of access to the secret trade route he's discovered that he might be made uh, kind of a what's called a viceroy which is an official government kind of governor a Castilian governor over these islands that he might discover that are useful and that he would personally he later believes uh, he is personally given permission to uh, take 10% of any gold or other silver, valuable minerals, whatever, that he might find in the ground of any of these lands that Castile is going to conquer to control the trade routes. So Cologne, you know, this is a big risk for him, but he's fully confident in his calculations. And uh, if he's correct and he can uh, gain control over some islands, he thinks he's going to be made extraordinarily personally rich off of this and that the government's going to empower him to kind of run the trade routes. So uh, Cologne is thinking very big at this point. And his expedition leaves in uh, August of 1492. Um, I think the date is August 3rd. Uh, so they set sail and they go directly west out into the open ocean. And uh, he's expecting to land somewhere um, east of China. Uh, there's reportedly some islands out there uh, somewhere around east of China or east of India. Um, so they set sail and uh, he's going directly west for the most part. And uh, eventually, you can see on this map, his 1492-93 uh, voyage uh, with this line, uh, eventually they run into what we now know as the Caribbean islands off of the American continents. But uh, the Europeans didn't know that the American continents were even there. So um, we now know that they landed on an island that the Castilians and the Spanish will eventually call Española, or in some textbooks it calls it Hispaniola with a H-I. Um, but it's the same island. It's this kind of big kind of squarish island that you see the line ending at and eventually kind of turning around and going back. Um, so Cologne and his voyage lands there. Um, you know, they make contact with natives, they uh, land a kind of exploration crew um, on the island itself, and they kind of explore around, make contact with natives, and try to communicate and all this stuff. Um, Cologne sets up a, uh, basically a colony on the island, and um, take some native plants and native fruits and even a few native people themselves um, and puts them on boats and uh, starts the return voyage in uh, spring 1493. So they basically spend the winter uh, for uh, 1492 going into 93 on the island or anchored at harbor just off of the island and uh, load up with some resources and Cologne makes the return voyage in spring 1493 and leaves behind a bunch of uh, kind of his colonists on the island so it's not like all of the uh, kind of Spanish explorers and crew uh, they don't all go back to Spain or Castile in 1493 a bunch of them stay behind so uh, he arrives back in uh, 1493 to Castile and he goes straight to the government reports his findings um, and he says, I have found the secret route. I landed in this kind of island network uh, that is just off of uh, India. And um, I have called these the, the Western Indies, basically. And I've made contact with these native people, um, which are kind of darker skinned people that speak a kind of strange language that Cologne didn't know anything about. So he called them Indians because he thinks that he's at the islands off of India. Um, and uh, he tells uh, the government all this, and he thinks that he has still found the secret route to the uh, Indian markets. And um, the government doesn't really believe him. Uh, the government uh, immediately 
starts to believe that he has actually discovered a previously unknown place in the world um, that he didn't go far enough to get all the way to India. So um, even though he found something, um, they say, look, you only went a few thousand miles, and we, uh, the scientists still believe that uh, China and India are at least 13,000 miles away. So um, Cologne will continue arguing and believing that he found uh, the Indies, or he found the secret route to India, um, and he'll believe that for the rest of his life into the early 1500s, um, and he'll continue running more voyages with government funding until his death in 1506. Uh, the government, though, does not believe him, and they start funding other explorers to also take boats and start kind of poking around the area that he had um, run into and start trying to figure out, you know, what is this place um, and start kind of uh, filling in the map, basically, of uh, where these lands are. So at first, I think it's just a kind of series of islands, and uh, future explorations will reveal that there's these major continents um, and uh, future explorers will continue trying to figure out uh, how they're trying to get around the continents basically to uh, continue sailing directly west to eventually get to China and, um, and India uh, but that becomes extremely difficult because as we now know um, and they would find out in a, within a few decades or so these continents are absolutely massive and there's uh, not much of an access uh, to the, the western ocean to get to China um, but there's a kind of continuing controversy between the, the Castilian government and other governments and Cologne and the scientists. Um, so Cologne will keep claiming that he found the Indies forever. Um, and uh, not many kind of scientific type people really believe him. They think he found something else. Um, the Castilian government, though, especially Isabella, she is very interested in kind of claiming all this land for Castile um, and eventually for uh, unified Spain as they start to bring the kind of kingdoms of Castile, Aragon, Navarre together to create Spain as we now think of it. So um, Isabel is looking for some kind of international recognition of her government's claim to all these lands. And uh, Portugal is kind of in the same place. They want uh, official international recognition of their discoveries uh, mostly around the African continent. Um, and the problem by the kind of within just a few years is that a lot of other explorers start going out into the Atlantic Ocean and poking around and they start running into each other out in the open ocean and close to islands and whatnot. And uh, there's kind of conflicts over who's going to get what land and uh, these ships start attacking each other. Um, all over the place. So it's kind of a, like a wild, wild west out in the oceans um, where people are laying claim to land and then they're attacking each other and there's uh, kind of rampant murder and warfare, uh, kind of unofficial warfare going on. Um, so there needs to be some kind of international agreement about who controls what land. Castile and Portugal, their uh, governments go to the kind of generally recognized uh, kind of independent quasi-government in Europe, uh, which is really the Catholic Church. And they go to the Pope and say, uh, we need some kind of uh, agreement. Can you uh, moderate or create some kind of agreement that we can all abide by to avoid this, uh, these conflicts that we're having? So the Pope eventually and his uh, people uh, broke out a map of the ocean and uh, basically drew a line down the kind of middle of the Atlantic Ocean and said, all right, all the kind of Spanish-funded explorers stay to the western side of this line, since you have kind of discovered or laying claim to a lot of these islands and these land-based systems out in the west, and the Portuguese explorers should stay to the east of the line because they're mostly interested in exploring the African coastline and the kind of South Africa and getting to India along that route. Uh, what nobody knew at that point when they drew this line in 1494 was that the line would eventually kind of slice a big chunk of uh, South America, that continent, off and give it to the Portuguese explorers because none of the explorers had found that place yet, so they didn't even know it was there. Uh, so eventually Portugal will get access to some uh, South American colonies that they will eventually create as Brazil. And even to today, because Brazil starts off as a Portuguese colony, even to this moment, uh, Brazil still speaks Portuguese.
um, or a kind of American derivative of Portuguese. And uh, virtually the rest of um, the Central and South American and Caribbean colonies all speak Spanish to this day. So uh, that's kind of the kind of creation of uh, Brazil, even though it's not even uh, explored yet. So a lot of, uh, there's a lot of long-term results of this 1494 Treaty of Tordesillas, as it becomes known. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the Spanish governments, the Spanish kingdoms and the Portuguese kingdom were pretty happy with this result. Um, it was basically both stay on your side and uh, don't get in each other's way. Uh, the rest of the Europeans, uh, European governments and European explorers don't like this agreement very much because it shuts them out. So uh, other European powers basically refuse to follow it, um, but they're going to only get involved in the colonization and exploration game pretty late, um, not for almost a, really another 70 or 80 years. Uh, so the other major European powers are kind of still fighting amongst each other or something in Europe, and they don't really invest heavily in explorations or colonization for several decades. Um, so uh, they, they feel like they're cut out, but they're not really so much of a problem, uh, at least for a while. Uh, and of course, the Ottoman Empire, because they're Muslims, they just don't care what the Pope thinks at all. They don't follow his orders. They don't think he's important. Um, but the Ottomans aren't involved in these explorations in the least, so they're kind of uh, off to the side of all this. Uh, so the next section, we're going to talk about what's the result of all this stuff for the Caribbean colonies. And uh, we're going to start off uh, because uh, we're going to start off mostly focusing on the Spanish colonies because they're the ones that are going to run the Caribbean for at least quite a while, according to the treaty. So uh, the first explorers um, were mostly focused on trade. Uh, they wanted to buy and sell goods, exotic goods, that the Europeans don't have much access to in Europe or they don't make in Europe. Uh, so they want to buy these exotic goods that are very rare in Europe. They want to load up boats with them and bring all those goods back into Europe and sell them for extravagant prices because they're so rare. They're kind of a exotic um, kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, rich people like to buy exotic rare things to show off how important and special they are. So uh, the basic economic plan is for the explorers and merchants to go out into these uh, other parts of the world and um, you know, buy those goods fairly cheap in their own home civilizations where they're plentiful, where the cost is low, and then bring them back to Europe and sell them where they're extremely rare and they can jack up the prices and uh, make a huge profit if you can do this successfully. So a lot of the Castilian colonizers, um, as they go into the Caribbean and they start doing this type of trade, uh, they generally expect that their um, colonization is going to be about the same process as the reconquest, uh, the reconquista in Iberia itself. So they uh, basically hoped or planned that they would go out to these islands or whatever they're colonizing and uh, they will basically replicate uh, the Castilian land ownership feudal government system where they will conquer some amount of land and they'll divide it up uh, amongst the conquerors and uh, those conquerors will become landowners and they will uh, run the land and get a labor supply in there to do the actual work. So the conquerors themselves, the conquistadors, are um, often in it for themselves and in it to make a lot of money. So a lot of the conquerors actually come from fairly common backgrounds. Um, these are not big rich family members or members from big rich land-owning families in Castile or Aragon uh, itself because this is really risky business. They're going to a new place um, that is kind of unknown. They're going to try to conquer it from native groups and who knows how many natives are out there, who knows what kind of technology militarily that they have or if they're going to be willing to fight back in the first place. Um, and who knows what kind of diseases might be out there that Europeans might catch. Uh, because the Europeans that have been exposed to a lot of Western African diseases were decimated by those, as we talked about last time. So this is really, really kind of uh, a very risky and dangerous adventure for these conquerors um, to go out and attempt. So the rich families in Castile and Aragon, they basically said, 
we're not trying this because we're already rich enough to not care. Um, we don't want to, you know, take those risks on ourselves. So a lot of the conquerors and conquistadors and explorers actually come from more common families um, that are looking to achieve great wealth for themselves, to break into the landowning lifestyle. Uh, so their goal is mostly to um, get rich in the colonies somehow uh, through owning land and producing goods or maybe just buying goods and bringing them back to Europe. Um, and their, their plan is really to return to Europe, get back to Iberia, to their home kingdoms, and live a nice rich lifestyle for the rest of their life. So they're often not looking to colonize and run lands in the Caribbean for the long term. They're thinking... Uh, I'll go do that job for five or ten years and, you know, make my great wealth and then basically retire and go back home. So uh, you can compare that to uh, maybe people today who say, well, I don't really like the job I'm doing now, but it pays me so much money, I'll do it for, you know, I'll sacrifice you know, five or ten years doing this crappy job, uh, make my millions of dollars and then just quit and just, you know, live the good life uh, for, for the rest of my existence. Uh, so that's what a lot of these... Uh, uh, kind of commoners, conquistadors, conquerors are thinking. Um, the problem that they run into though is once they get out into the colonies uh, or they get out into these islands and they conquer lands, they take over, uh, they expected the natives to work for them. Like the natives were going to want to work for these foreign occupiers, uh, which obviously didn't work because the natives you know, didn't uh, want to work for the foreigners. Uh, the natives had their own kind of economic systems and whatnot. Um, so the, you know, the natives didn't want to participate in this. So the Castilians and other Spanish uh, colonizers um, eventually will enslave those natives who refuse to work for them. Um, and uh, that native slavery will become basically the basis of the uh, Spanish colonial economy. Um, and uh, the native slavery becomes pretty horrific. Um, it will be very different from uh, the slavery that natives had used to, among each other before the Spanish ever even showed up. So the, the native um, Americans, a lot of their different groups, had already been using slavery. I mean, they, they had experience with slavery, mostly kind of criminals or uh, prisoners of war or something like that. Um, but the slavery that the Spanish are going to inflict on them is going to be a whole nother level of, um, kind of horror. Um, so how does this all, whole system work? Um, basically, the Spanish uh, would attack some islands or some coastlines or gain land somehow. Um, they would uh, enslave the natives who refused to work for them. And they usually would try to keep um, the na native labor groups... Um, kind of together under their native leader, their native chief. So it was basically the Spanish uh, kind of forming a deal with the native chief to force native workers under the chief's command uh, to work on the Spanish-owned lands. So this became known as repartimiento. Uh, it's basically um, a native labor group that was assigned to work for a Spanish colonizer under the native chief's direction. And the Spanish colonizer became known as encomienda. So that is the basic kind of division of labor system that will last in these colonies uh, sometimes for centuries. And um, pretty quickly there arises a lot of complaint uh, within about a decade or so of uh, what the Spanish are doing to the natives and uh, some of the earliest complaints are published in 1511 by a Spanish um, priest in the Catholic Church named Father Antonio Montesinos. So he published the first direct critique. I mean he went to the colonies in the Caribbean and witnessed what was going on and thought it was absolutely horrific. So he started writing pamphlets that directly criticized the Spanish colonizers for the brutality 
of the slavery system that they're basically forcing upon the natives. Um, so uh, Montesinos published uh, several of those critiques in about 1511. Uh, the bigger level critiques would come from another um, kind of former uh, Spanish landowner in the area uh, in Encomendero himself who gave up on that system because he thought it was so brutal um, named Bartolome de las Casas who wrote a series of scaling critiques down through the years um, demanding that the Spanish government uh, basically end the uh, repartiment the Encomendero Encomien the who demanded that uh, the Spanish government end the repartimiento system. So uh, those are two of the major critiques. Uh, other critiques will emerge throughout the years in the early 1500s, uh, going up into the uh, 1540s when the government does eventually decide to uh, reform the system. Um, but early on in the 15 teens, uh, Ferdinand II of Aragon uh, who was basically running a kind of unified Spanish kingdom at this point, uh, he refused to make any changes because he said that the Pope had declared that all the lands and its, quote, heathen peoples uh, are now owned by Spain and that uh, it is the Spanish government and the Catholic Church's job to convert all those uh, Native Americans to Christianity. So any Natives that refused that conversion the government was fully justified in waging a war or forcing the natives into certain kind of Spanish lifestyles uh, to convert them to Christianity, which would obviously also include uh, forcing them to work um, in the Spanish landowning system. Uh, and that Spanish landowning system, the kind of native enslavement and comandero system, uh, would expand as the Spanish continue on conquering other islands in the Caribbean. Um, the Spanish, though, at any colony that they're going to create, uh, they want to create a major kind of central city as uh, the center of the colonial government there that'll run things, a kind of cultural center for the colony, and also a, a place where the economy functions at its highest level, so it's kind of a economic magnet for traders and merchants and um, landowners to uh, bring their products to market to buy and sell and exchange. So the Spanish often see the city as like the crowning achievement of colonization because that's where they bring civilization uh, to the colony and to the native peoples and, and to the, uh, the islands in general. So this is a kind of early map of one of the early uh, big cities that the Spanish will try to create, um, established in 1496, called Santo Domingo, which is in the first island that uh, Cologne had contacted, Española. Um, so future colonizers and future islands will also try to build cities, uh, kind of capital cities, uh, to bring civilization and commerce and uh, a governing center to any place that they try to colonize throughout Latin America. So that's just a kind of system that the Spanish government will try to implement in all of their conquests going forward. And they do start going forward fairly soon to uh, conquer at least the other islands, at least the other major islands of the Caribbean, even as they're still poking and prodding around the area and trying to map it all. Um, the government uh, officially took over control over all of Española from Cologne in the year 1500 and set up a new kind of royal governor. Um, eventually they brought Cologne back to Spain uh, in chains, arrested for several different crimes. Um, and the new government will try to kind of stabilize the colony on the island, which on this map here is called Hispaniola, which is right in the center um, of the map. So, um, that's where the major colony first is on that island with their city at Santo Domingo. Um, the new colonial government tries to stabilize things and increase prosperity and trade and try to control the whole island itself um, and subdue all the natives on the island and uh, you know get things going on a systematic way. 
but a lot of the colonists uh, were still uh, hoping to find gold or valuable minerals or something like that in the islands, and they didn't re really find a whole lot. Uh, so the kind of um, big landowners and the richest colonists uh, decide that they want to try to go to other of the islands in the area and look to see if they can find gold or any other kinds of uh, uh, valuable minerals that they can immediately get rich off of instead of you know growing food in their lands and uh, slowly getting rich over 10 years. Um, so they're getting uh, pretty greedy. So a lot of the you know gold mine owners who had gotten rich and even a lot of the landowners who hadn't gotten rich off of gold, uh, they start looking at other islands to kind of uh, try to conquer. So uh, they're going to go off and uh, attack uh, what is today called Puerto Rico, which is the island directly to the east of Hispaniola. They're going to attack and conquer that island in 1508. Um, they're going to go after Cuba a couple years later in 1511, which you can see on the map, Cuba is uh, absolutely massive when compared to uh, Puerto Rico or Hispaniola. Um, but they do attack uh, Cuba and then conquer all of the entire Cuban island in 1511. And they go from there and try to attack some smaller island networks like the Bahamas uh, in the years afterward. But uh, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Española will be the major kind of islands uh, under Spanish control for the long term. And you can see they're the three kind of largest islands um, in existence in the Caribbean, so uh, that becomes the basis of uh, the Spanish conquest going forward. Um, in in all of these uh, islands that they're conquering, uh, they basically replicated the same system that they had used uh, um, in conquering Española at first. They made contact with the natives, uh, they traded with those natives, then they conquered the island, um, forced the natives to work on uh, Spanish-owned lands in the repartimiento system. And of course a lot of natives refused and they had to be forced so they were basically enslaved. And uh, a lot of the natives started to die off because the Europeans were bringing uh, European diseases that the natives had never had contact with, especially stuff like smallpox. Uh, so uh, you start getting these disease pandemics in the colonies that wipe out huge numbers of native workers and natives in general. Um, and then the just brutal work regime that the Spanish inflicted on uh, the native slaves killed off a whole lot of natives all by itself. And they tried to force the natives to eat uh, Spanish-based food that the Spanish were used to eating, which changed the native diet, which may have uh, done a lot of harm to the native uh, survivability of the work and the diseases that they're being exposed to. So uh, the colonizers keep the land basically demanding more conquests more land, searching for more gold mines, more silver, um, and when uh, they don't find those gold mines, uh, they convert the land into Spanish-style uh, encomendero farms, um, and uh, they demand more native labor. So it's a system that keeps on expanding and expanding as time goes on. So the same process kept repeating on each island, um, and the uh, uh, Spanish landowners kept increasing their demands for more lands, more conquest, more labor, and it just uh, is kind of a snowball effect, just keeps growing on itself. And the next section we'll start talking about is uh, really um, as the Spanish start getting control over more and more islands, they start looking to the mainland in the early 1500s as their explorations are starting to map out the coastline of the mainland. Uh, the Spanish will start to try to attack and colonize uh, mainland, especially South America, as we today call it at first, and parts of Central America. So uh, they first start exploring um, the coastline, the northern coastline of South America, which we see on this map, in the year 1500. Uh, they tried to establish a colony at modern-day Panama, which is a kind of western offshoot on this map just to the left, just to the west of the label Viceroyalty of Peru, that kind of offshoot of land going up into Central America, uh, they uh, call that Panama, and they try to form a um, colony there, a Spanish colony, um, did not succeed very well because uh, they ran into uh, 
kind of tropical diseases that the Europeans weren't very experienced with. And so uh, the tropical diseases that were native to the Americas uh, did damage to the European explorers and colonizers in Panama and uh, almost totally destroyed the colony until uh, one guy named uh, Blasco Nunez de Balboa um, tried uh, to have peaceful relations with the natives of the area in order to stabilize the colony and uh, grow the colony. Um, and that uh, idea of peacefully buying land or making deal with the natives of the area was so unpopular among the other Spanish colonists um, that they decided to get rid of Balboa um, and they put him on trial for treason basically. They trumped up some charges against him and executed him. Uh, so the, the Panama colony fell back into the kind of greedy land-based system and tried to force uh, um, native enslavement of the area basically. So the, the colony does not succeed for the long term and will wait for future attempts at colonization. Um, the islands, Cuba, the big island, would become the kind of basis, the military base, from which the Spanish would launch uh, other invasions of the mainland. Um, and once they finally get uh, the Panama colony stabilized, they will use Panama to launch military invasions further south along the coastline uh, going into South America. Um, so uh, eventually, uh, fairly quickly, by the end of the 15 teens, around the year 1520 or so, uh, Cuba becomes the kind of center of the colonial governments for the whole Caribbean region. Um, so that, that's where the uh, Spanish government decision making will be held in the colonies, and that's where the, the big Spanish army in the colonies will exist. And it'll be kind of moved around uh, as necessary for conquest or defending what they've conquered. So uh, by about the year 1519 or so, there's a pretty consistent, uh, normal way that the Spanish are colonizing and uh, controlling labor and whatnot. So we'll go through those kind of step by step by the year 1519. Uh, the biggest is that any Spanish colony is really completely and totally reliant on slavery uh, for that colony to economically survive. Uh, basically, the Spanish were conquering an amount of land that they were not bringing enough Spanish colonizers to do the work themselves. So they needed a labor force. And they basically enslaved the natives of the area and forced them to do the work. Um, and uh, exposure to European diseases would start to decimate those native populations. And they eventually uh, kind of die off to the point that... Um, the, they are not capable of doing the, enough manual labor to satisfy the needs of the Spanish colony. So the Spanish will eventually start bringing over uh, African slaves a few decades later uh, to replace the native slaves who have died off in such mass numbers that they're just not reliable. So um, a lot of the mainland societies, mainland colonies, um, the, the natives of the area already had experience with slavery. They'd already used slavery before the Spanish ever showed up because the natives attacked each other for land. They had their own native kingdoms and tribes and whatnot. And, uh, you know, there was infighting, and they would take prisoners of war or criminals or something and enslave them and move those slaves around. Um, but when the Spanish showed up, and uh, the Spanish would inflict a much larger, harsher uh, form of what we would call chattel slavery, uh, slavery that treats the slave as uh, basically cattle, as a kind of subhuman and uh, uh, just just kind of muscle labor uh, that could be exploited uh, to death uh, um, according to the needs of the colonizers. So uh, the biggest uh, kind of enslavers early on will actually take place in Central America uh, the Spanish will go in and, and enslave huge amounts of native populations and then export those slaves to different Spanish colonies uh, in Panama, into the Caribbean islands, and eventually further south into South America. Uh, uh, historians believe it, that the Spanish did this to at least 50,000 natives uh, living in Central America, moved them around, and perhaps up to hundreds of thousands of natives from Central America were enslaved and moved. Um, so the slavery system is uh, 
large, it's growing, and it's absolutely brutal. Um, the Spanish government uh, would continue here to hear reports of how horrific uh, the colonial enslavement of the natives was and would try to pass some laws in the 1540s officially ending native slavery uh, but the colonists were so dependent on native slavery they just refused to enforce the law so that uh, shows you the amount of or the extent that the colonies relied completely on slavery um, a lot of the early Africans that made their way to the Caribbean were not actually enslaved uh, a lot of them uh, signed up as soldiers in the military conquests to take over the colonies from the Native Americans of the area. So um, the Africans that are around in the Caribbean for the first few decades are not slaves themselves. They're actually soldiers and some of them, uh, because they're participating in the conquest, they become landowners themselves and they will take control over Native slaves. Um, so there's uh, not so much a clear distinction so far in the early 1500s that every single African uh, is a slave in, in the Caribbean and the New World. So that will develop uh, much later in the late 1500s when the natives have died off in such numbers that uh, the Europeans will start importing massive amounts of African slaves um, because they need uh, some labor supply that will survive the um, the diseases, the epidemics. And eventually the African slave labor force will be the biggest part of especially the Brazilian population uh, by the year 1700. But that doesn't largely start until um, the Caribbean islands and uh, the Portuguese colony of Brazil uh, transitions into uh, mass sugar production. Um, in the later 1500s. So in the end, uh, forced native labor in the early 1500s uh, saved the colonies from lack of capital, lack of money investment, lack of a labor supply. And it's only much later, uh, several decades later, that the Iberians, the Spanish, and the Portuguese will start importing mass amounts of African slaves um, to replace the native slave labor force that has died off due to um, disease for the most part. Uh, another thing about the Spanish colonies um, that becomes kind of normal by 1519 is that the merchants are making the biggest profits. Uh, the importers and exporters, the buyers and sellers are the ones that are making the most money off this whole colonial system because they're the ones that bring the goods back and forth. They bring European supplies to the colonies to get the colonies off the ground and they're also the ones that transport American made goods and foods and all this exotic stuff back into Europe to sell for a mass profit so the merchants are actually getting the richest off of the colonial system it's not the landowners it's not the encomenderos um, it's definitely not the native slaves uh, it's not even the gold mine owners that are uh, digging gold out of the ground and selling it on European gold markets or making money out of it, literally. Um, it's really the merchants, the supply lines, um, that get the richest off of this uh, colonial system. And that will continue to be reality for years and years, centuries even. Uh, next one is that uh, the Spanish government insisted and expected really to uh, recreate or replicate um, basically the Spanish economy in the Caribbean. Uh, they expected the Caribbean economy to be based in agriculture and that it would have a few big cities as uh, kind of government centers and uh, market centers, trading centers, economic centers, um, because that's what existed in the Spanish kingdoms. Uh, they were overwhelmingly agricultural. They were not really industrial. Uh, they didn't have a whole lot of merchants or artisans. Uh, they were overwhelmingly farms. And so the Spanish governments uh, just believe by default that that's uh, the kind of uh, society and the kind of economy that they would build in the colonies. And the Spanish government would try to directly control all trade with the colonies. So they pass a law saying that um, 
any trade, any goods that come out of the colonies, they cannot just be shipped anywhere. They have to go to Spain, and they have to go to a special city in Spain, uh, Seville, which is one of the Spanish biggest cities, uh, so that those goods could be offloaded, um, their cargoes could be verified by government officials and tax collectors. So uh, the government tax collectors would be at Seville, at the port, uh, waiting for the ships to come in, and they would look at the cargo list, and as the cargo is being unloaded, they would verify that that list is accurate, and they would collect the tax on it. And once the cargo is verified and the tax is paid, then they could get it back on the boat and um, sail to any other place in Europe, basically, that they wanted to take the goods. Uh, but the Spanish did this because the government wanted its cut um, of the colonial goods that the government was funding and keeping the colonies alive and defending militarily. So, um, by law, all trade has to go through Seville first as a kind of gatekeeper before the American goods can go into the rest of the European markets. And the Spanish thought this was a good idea because they didn't just want to let the boats go anywhere because, uh, you know, if a, a merchant ship from the Americas um, goes and lands in London instead, the English are going to collect that tax and the Spanish are going to be left out. The Spanish government's not going to get much out of it. So they create this law saying that all shipping has to go through Seville first. And that, you know, sound, it sounds like a good plan for the Spanish government, but it will uh, restrict and harm a lot of the growth of colonial trade for the long term. Uh, another thing that becomes true about the Spanish colonies by 1519 is that there's more conquerors and conquistadors and adventurers um, that are looking for the next opportunity to invade and conquer lands. Um, and these guys are starting to hear rumors about um, uh, native kingdoms somewhere off the coastline, uh, way in the interior of the continent, that have gold everywhere. And, and the rumor says that the streets are literally paved with gold, that the gold is so common in those societies. So a lot of these adventurers hear these rumors about these gold-based empires or kingdoms somewhere, or cities somewhere out there in the interior, and that convinces a lot of the explorers um, to start looking for that gold and start conquering more land. So these adventurers are looking for the next great kind of gold strike um, because they want to get rich. They figure if they discover that place, uh, the famous El Dorado, um, that they can conquer that place. And uh, if the city really is made out of gold, they can just take chunks off of buildings and uh, you know go back to home to Iberia and be rich forever. Um, even if the city isn't literally paved in gold itself, uh, they're hoping to find some uh, gold mines nearby uh, that they can uh, get a bunch of workers into and mine the gold out and get the gold that way. So the adventurers are not looking so much for the long-term economic development of the colony. They're looking to uh, get rich themselves and then go back home as fast as possible. So these adventurers are not looking for trade routes to China anymore or India um, there uh, because you know getting those trade routes and then sending ships back and forth can take years and years uh, to make a profit off of all that and it's very risky because there's a lot of ocean to sail through and a lot of problems you can encounter um, so these adventurers aren't interested in that kind of long-term investment they're not even interested in uh, owning farms or anything and getting rich year after year uh, by selling uh, harvest crops and other farm implements, farming goods at market, and getting rich a little bit at a time over, who knows, 5, 10, 15 years, and then going home, these adventurers want to go find the gold, extract the gold in a few weeks or months, and then go back home uh, you know, as rich as they possibly can be so they can enjoy the rest of their lives. So those are uh, the kind of what is normal for Spanish colonization by 1519 and that colonization will continue uh, in our future lectures as we talk about how the Spanish uh, uh, conquer uh, some of the major native uh, empires, native kingdoms in the interior. Uh, but there's also some things we need to talk about generally about the relationship between the Spanish economic system, native slavery, and uh, the kind of native population and the natural environment of the Americas. So moving on to that section,
Um, you know, the Spanish are enslaving natives, and uh, it's possible for slaves to regain their freedom, and even for the children of uh, native slaves to be born into freedom, so they don't automatically inherit um, their parents' kind of enslaved status, at least uh, in the early years. Um, but the Spanish become very much obsessed with uh, race and the different races, and the idea of trying to keep them at least fairly separate uh, because they're basing uh, native existence, uh, being an adult native, especially man, on uh, being enslaved in the encomendero system. So uh, there's a lot of problems with the encomendero system, and that's the biggest one is largely that the Spanish landowner um, is there on the land, probably living in some kind of a larger house uh, on his land and is surrounded by native slaves and any time that you have that going on you'll usually see uh, the Spanish landowner fathering children with some of the female slaves and those children become known as mulattoes or pardos so they are basically the offspring of sexual relations uh, possibly rape between the Spanish landowner and the native female slaves. And usually uh, those mulatto or pardo children um, would inherit the slave status of their mother unless the father, the landowner, admitting to, admitted to impregnating the female slave and would uh, free that child from slavery and perhaps even take that child into their household. Um, but it's very seen as dishonorable and disreputable and humiliating for a Spanish landowner to uh, basically usually rape one of the native female slaves and father children with her. So oftentimes, even if the father officially freed the, the offspring, the child, the mixed race child, um, they would not take them into uh, the Spanish kind of landowner's family. Uh, or into the household because it was so embarrassing to have that child around. Um, and uh, the mixed race kind of mulatto definition could also apply to children born between relationships of uh, African landowners and native slaves. So it's not just the Spanish um, uh, people that are doing this, the Spanish landowners. Uh, some Africans own land are in, and are you know abusing their native slaves in the same way. And the costas are a Spanish term for a person that is obviously not fully Spanish, so quote not white, um, and obviously not fully native. So uh, those are another kind of mixed race definition. And uh, there's so much uh, kind of racial intermixture going on from about the 15 teens uh, that by about the year 1580, uh, the mixed races are the largest part of the Latin American population. So within about 50 or 60 years. So that shows you how much uh, uh, sexual intermingling was going on for the long term. And uh, as more and more Iberian women are willing or able to come to the colonies and uh, survive uh, after 1580 especially, um, there's more uh, Spanish women for these Spanish landowners to marry and father children with that the population, uh, the mixed race population has a much lower status because their kind of economic opportunities fall um, because the Spanish can uh, kind of regenerate the population just among themselves. Let's see, and the next slide shows um, a lot of, especially uh, when we see the growth of sugar plantations in the New World, um, the Spanish will start building sugar plantations in the Caribbean islands because it's a um, kind of tropical environment where sugar grows well. Uh, the biggest sugar plantations will be built in Portugal's colonies in Brazil. So that's where sugar actually starts becoming a giant profitable thing, 
and then later uh, the Spanish will uh, implement sugar plantations into the Caribbean area. So uh, sugar will become the giant what we call cash crop of the Caribbean and Brazil. Um, cash crop literally means that uh, the landowners are growing sugar not so much for their own consumption not as something to survive on as food but they're growing sugar literally just for sale so it's like they're growing money out of the ground and sugar is a giant uh, kind of fad in Europe because it makes food taste better um, so it's seen as a exotic um, kind of specialty additive to food that rich people use a lot and so sugar is very expensive it's very difficult to um, raise the sugar cane get it out of the ground and then refine the sugar um, into the kind of granule sugar that we know of today um, so it's it's extremely costly and uh, extremely um, takes a lot of resources to, to make the sugar into something that's kind of transportable and usable um, some researchers argue that the world population goes into an explosion phase in the 16 and 1700s, uh, largely as a result of uh, farming American crops that the Europeans had never seen before the 1500s and had never eaten because these American crops have much more calories in the food um, than any European, uh, normal European uh, food that they were growing in the old world. And so once you get this, the Europeans eating a lot of this American-made food, it has more calories, more energy in it, and that might have fueled the big population booms that we start to see, especially after the year 1700. Um, as the Europeans will start to bring in their livestock from Europe and uh, try to, you know, basically build European-type farms in the New World, in the Caribbean area, uh, those European livestock will often destroy the kind of fragile American ecosystems and destroy a lot of uh, Native American fields and crops and whatnot, um, which leads to a, a fighting between Native groups and the Europeans because they're destroying the natural environment um, to the point that uh, eventually, especially along what we today see as Mexico's eastern coastline uh, along the Gulf, um, it destroys the native environment to the point where we see what we call desertification um, of some of the more arid regions of Mexico where the naturally growing crops cannot survive the kind of invasion of European livestock. And also because European uh, diseases were ravaging native populations uh, that uh, fall in the European population totals actually helped the American environment uh, because the natives have been over farming uh, Mesoamerica for so many years so many centuries uh, that they were harming the environment by themselves so when a lot of natives start dying off from these uh, disease epidemics that allows the environment to kind of regenerate um, because the population strain on the land was shrinking so uh, many environmental areas in the Caribbean or uh, the American mainland, Central America, what we, is today Mexico and parts of South America, they actually grow even healthier by 1800 than they were when the Spanish first started making contact in the 1490s. But the Spanish themselves will bring a lot of destruction uh, to kind of counteract a lot of whatever natural environmental growth you may see as a result of shrinking populations. Uh, the Spanish especially um, hated uh, a lot of the kind of forested areas um, because they were seen as kind of valuable land that uh, the Europeans wanted to turn into farms. So th the Europeans start using the very similar kind of slash and burn uh, farming tactics to clear out uh, large wooded areas and to uh, push the the ashes um, <clears throat> into the soil <clears throat> to regenerate the soil and that made the soil very abundant for the first few years just as we talked about last uh, a few times ago uh, with um, the Native Americans often use some of these types of uh, slash and burn tactics but got the same result over the long term uh, 
uh, within about 10 years or so, uh, the land that had been uh, slashed and burned, uh, the nutrients are run out. So just like the natives back then, the Spanish uh, colonizers would have to pick up and slash and burn another section of land and move on to another place that, uh, where the land still had some nutrients left in it. So a lot of this is extremely damaging to the uh, American kind of environment. And uh, the Spanish generally uh, deplored and hated uh, a lot of the salty lakes, especially around what is today Mexico. Um, and there were some floods, actually, that the Spanish uh, blamed on the salty lakes in the early 1600s. So one thing that the Spanish started doing, especially in the, after the 1630s, is to start draining those salty lakes because they thought they were just kind of unnatural and destructive and uh, largely destroyed a lot of those lakes, completely annihilated them by the year 1900. Uh, the Spanish will also be destructive of the environment because they're going to start building new colonial cities in places that uh, no native group had ever built a large city before. And so that radically altered the land and caused a lot of damage. And uh, a lot of these uh, Spanish colonizers are looking to dig gold or silver or something out of the ground, so they establish mineral mines that often annihilate the native environment. And especially when they start using uh, mercury to smelt the silver and uh, separate silver from, kind of purify the silver from other uh, parts that they had dug out of the ground. Um, and mercury is basically poisonous. Um, it's not allowed to be used in large quantities, especially in the United States today. Uh, but mer the mercury kind of leftover after purifying the the silver uh, mercury was kind of gathered in pots and then uh, kind of dumped in landfills that poison the groundwater and poison the land for the long term so the mineral mines will become massively destructive of the natural environment also and of course because there's the spanish are creating a worldwide market for these american farming goods um, they start putting a gigantic strain on the environment, uh, or strain on the environment, to uh, grow as much food as they possibly can to ship it out to the rest of the world. Uh, so the increasing strain does a lot of environmental damage, also. And again, uh, a lot of the Spanish and Portuguese uh, make so much money off of that trade that they keep expanding those systems to uh, really take over a lot of what we today call Latin America. And uh, Latin America still deals with that environmental catastrophe to this day, the, at least the remnants of it. And uh, the native population itself is uh, pretty much annihilated through this, uh, throughout this whole process. Uh, scholars estimate that the total native population in 1492 was, uh, right when the contact started, was probably somewhere between 35 and 55 million um, throughout all of the Americas. And uh, once you see uh, the contact starting in, 14, in the 1490s, you start to see a drop. So even with this chart, by 1520, uh, there's only about 25 million Native Americans. And you have to remember, this is before the Spanish started full colonization of the mainland. The Spanish are mostly just in the Caribbean islands, in the Caribbean area. And there's some Portuguese explorations along the Brazilian coast. Uh, but just those early explorations for the first uh, say 20, 25 years, uh, reduced the native population by about at least 10 million, possibly 20 or 30 million. Um, and that's largely because of disease. So uh, this, the native population will continue to fall, especially by the, um, the 1540s when the Spanish conquests go into South America and modern-day Mexico in massive numbers and uh, those diseases continue to kill off a gigantic amount of Native Americans um, and also war and uh, th those that were left over were mostly enslaved to Spanish landowners. So we see a demographic collapse of the Native population and they fell to really rock bottom levels in the by the early 1600s there's only a few million natives left in the Americas. Um, and they'll stay at that rock bottom level until about the 1700s uh, probably the natives that survived the European diseases uh, started to build a kind of natural immunity to those diseases um, and so their populations will start to recover in the 1700s 
um, but they will not regain that uh, level of native population that existed before the 1490s, before the Spanish came along in the first place. Uh, the native population that will not grow back to that level until the early 1800s. So the combination of diseases, wars, uh, wars of conquest, uh, enslavement and other mistreatment of natives, um, forcing them to work on Spanish uh, lands, the encomendero system, and uh, probably also a, a Spanish attempt at cultural eradication. Uh, Spanish tried to convert the natives to Christianity and force them to uh, speak European languages and uh, tried to completely eradicate the Native American religious beliefs and Native American kind of social systems. Uh, just caused a, probably a, a ton of psychological trauma um, as the natives watch uh, many of their family members either uh, die of disease or get killed in war or be enslaved themselves. Um, so all these uh, kind of processes added up to really annihilate the native population and keep it at a fairly no, low number for hundreds of years. And even as they start to recover in the 1800s, um, that's when a lot of the Latin American colonies will declare independence and uh, you'll see new wars, revolutionary wars, that will also eradicate uh, huge amounts of natives because a lot of those wars turn, uh, turn into race wars, basically. So uh, this is what we're looking at for the long term as the Spanish, uh, by 1519, 1520, will start to launch off on their major conquest, especially attacking the Aztec and the Incan empires. And those are the lectures that we're going to get into in the next couple of days. So we'll stop here, and uh, um, we're kind of laid the groundwork for going further in the next couple of days.